Hi, this is Tim Belcher, and welcome back to the channel. I want to continue my laser map series. In previous videos, I've shown you how to create a laser cut lake map. I've also shown you how to combine map data with bathymetric data for islands or shorelines. And today I want to show you how to create a laser cut city street map, and specifically a raised street city map. Now these are quite popular online and on Etsy. Although the more I dig into Etsy, the more I find poor quality vector files or projects where people just didn't spend enough time or have enough attention to detail. So I want to show you how to create one of these maps start to finish. I'm going to include my files on Etsy as well. Not only the graphics files, but the Affinity Designer design file, as well as my Lightburn file. But the goal of this project is you won't need to buy it from me or anyone else. You'll be able to do this by yourself, customize it, and make it all your own. So a laser cut raised street city map. This is how I made it. As with my previous lake art examples, we're going to start at Snazzy Maps. I've given a description of Google Maps and sites like Snazzy Maps before in this series, but let's just say that this site or sites like this let us control the elements of Google Maps to show or hide labels, to change the weight of lines, to change the color of geometry, etc. And we use a site like this to get a series of clean graphics we can then manipulate in our graphics program. Let me back up a second. Here I've zoomed into an area around Manhattan and I have started with a deep blue theme. I start with the option to build a map, then I select the option to view the style details, and then finally select the customize style options. And that will reveal all the available options for me to customize. In general, I will go through all the options and turn off the visibility of the geometry and the labels. Now, I'll be the first to say that this site can be a bit buggy or non-intuitive. The good news is there are only 20 or so areas that you need to control geometry and labels. So I find it best to work up the stack instead of down and start by turning off all the visibility for all of them. And then I can individually turn on the visibility I want. So what am I after from this site? For this project, I'm after four pictures. And since I'm after pictures, I want them to be close to black and white images. I'm gonna convert these pictures to vector files so I want them easy to scan. I want one picture of the land, which obviously should include the water. Then I can turn off the land and turn on each of the highway, arterial, and local roads. Change those to black and white and save that second image. I'll then turn off all the local roads and save only the main roads, the highway and arterial. And I'll later use this layer to do the raised street map. And lastly, I'll turn off all the roads and just select the parks under the points of interest and change those to black and white as well and save that fourth image out. And for each of these images, I'm gonna to choose to download them at their max dimensions, 1000 by 1000 pixels and choose the option for a 3X scaling factor. And that's gonna get me four images that are exactly 3000 by 3000 pixels. And sometimes you need to go back and adjust or make changes. For instance, here on my main land and water image, I needed to go back and change the weight of the lines for the water down to a minimum. That gets rid of a lot of small streams and tributaries that would not laser very well. And it saves some time in the actual graphics work. I will then convert those pictures to EPS files, a type of vector format, and for this, I'll use an inexpensive tool on my Mac called Image Vectorizer. Don't worry if you don't have this, just Google search and there are online options for this conversion. Or if you're using Adobe Illustrator, there's an actual image trace option built in that you could use. One tip that was not in my previous videos, when I convert these to EPS, I'm gonna choose to add a five pixel white border around the image. These images are close to black and white, they're actually gray and white. And the white border will help each image come out the exact same size. And without that white border, the conversion may clip the EPS file to only the black areas that are visible. And that makes you have to manually stretch and move that section to align it to the others. 
I'll then open each of those EPS files in my graphics program, which is Affinity Designer. Everything I'm going to do in this project is easily done in Adobe products as well, and nothing here is too complicated that a simple YouTube search on a function or an operation will not help you do this in Adobe or even Corel. The first thing I'll do is clean up each EPS file. Now an EPS file is just a collection of vector shapes and in each file I want to remove the shapes for the Google marks as well as anything that's too small for the laser to cut or etch nicely. These could be really small lakes or really small portions of roads for example. Then I will take that layer from the EPS file and paste it into a new canvas, a fairly large canvas. And then it's a rinse and repeat for the roads, the major roads, and then the parks. I'm going to take my time with each layer. I want not only to clean them up, but to combine the various shapes into a single shape, or at least as few as possible. And that helps me make each of my layers as simplistic as possible. Once I have all four layers posted into the new canvas, I will then resize them to something larger together. I'll figure out how large in a minute, but for now, I want to take a little time and organize my files. I want to recolor each layer, name each layer, and order each layer so that we can get a glimpse of what we're working with. As for how large to make the map, I decided I wanted the raised roads to be a minimum of about two millimeters across. And there's not really a good measuring tool in Affinity so I'll just create a two millimeter little red square and drag it around the map and check by eye. I will engrave all the roads onto the land layer, but I'll take the major roads and cut them out to overlay them. So I'll take some time and scan the map and remove sections of the raised roads that would be too small for the laser to cut well. This is again a creative process and in some ways, too much detail may take away from the overall map. And I'll do this by going into a node edit mode and removing various tiny details like small cutouts and various on-ramps or intersections. My current laser has a map size of just under 20 inches by 12 inches. So I can see if my sizing will work for that laser by simply drawing a square that size, positioning it where I want it, and changing its opacity to mostly transparent. And that'll give me an idea if the sizing is right for my specific laser, which in this case it does look good. But this same art can be used to make different sizes, and in fact, I'm first going to work on a 20 by 20 inch version here. If you wanted a very simple map, at this point you're ready to start exporting your artwork into Lightburn. And indeed on Etsy it seems most people do this. But for me, this is sort of the beginning. This is where I start to add details to the map locations and neighborhoods and street names. I'm going to do this in a way that this detail is actually optional, but more on that later. You can see here I've tried several times to create some sort of motif for area labels. Finally, I decide on something simple as a background, a rounded rectangle that will be sized to the text, and a standard Mac OS font. The plan I have in mind is to take the background shape and combine it to the raised street layer. I'll engrave the actual text onto that layer before I cut it out and that looks good enough to continue on with this concept. I'm going to fast forward a bit and show you some of what I've done here. I've created dozens and dozens of area labels, cities, boroughs, neighborhoods, throughout the map. Each one of these at this point is a group of the background shape and the text. I then moved on to the street names, which were a bit trickier for placement, but the same general concept. I know from previous experience that I can get readable engravings of fonts down to about a font size of six, and depending on the font, even less. So I'll choose a smaller text size for the roads, but one that will be legible, and then I will size the background area to tightly wrap the road name, and then angle them into place depending on the road. Overall, this was time consuming, but fairly simple and repetitive. I then added a border, in this case, three quarters of an inch around, and that was as simple as subtracting one box from another. And I want to use that water area in the lower left to place a skyline graphic on the border and cut out New York. I end up changing this somewhat later to a new layout, but the process was similar. And then I can clean up the geometry to see how that border would look. And now we come to a point where I begin to make backup graphics. There are a lot of options forward on this piece. Uh, should I include road and location labels? Do I want to delete the geometry of the land layer to make that skyline look better? What if I change my mind on the border? 
It's sometimes easy to combine shapes and nearly impossible to undo them. So at this point, I'm going to take all my layer components and copy and paste them and rename them as backups. And from this point forward, I'll copy them out when I want to try something different, and that always provides me a save location in my workflow. Now I'm going to take a copy of my neighborhood labels and select all of those background shapes. I can then copy and paste them into my major street layer and combine them. And had I not made backup copies, this step might not be possible to undo later. I can then also select all the street name background shapes and do the same. And finally, I can grab a copy of the border and add it to this layer as well. I ended up repeating this workflow perhaps half a dozen times, which shows you how important those backup graphics were. Each time I'd find problems or mistakes or want to do something just a little bit different. And here you can actually see me revert back and change that skyline graphic to get something a little closer to what I wanted. Just take your time and be patient and realize that this is an iterative process. This time lapse is probably about 30 minutes in real time. But once this layer was done, I could export it as an SVG in Diffusion 360 to get a look at the layer. And I'm not going to go into much detail about this as taking graphics like this in Diffusion can be a giant pain, but it can be very useful to get a visual 3D representation of your work. Okay, let's get these files into Lightburn. And up until this point, I've been shading the various graphics layers so you and I can better visualize them in Affinity. As I move into Lightburn, I'm going to take each layer and change it to a black and white image. I'll set both the border and the fill color to black and then make only the specific layers or information I want visible. I'll then select the artboard, which is 20 by 20 inches, and export as a PNG and choose to export my selection only without a background. I will do this for my top layer, which is that raised major roads, the border, and those shapes for engraving. Then I'll select the neighborhood and road names only, the actual text, and export those the same way. The land is next, with the border as well. And then onto the roads, with a white border. Then a simple rectangle for the bottom layer, which I could have done in Lightburn easily, and the names of the rivers. And I now have a total of six transparent PNG files I can bring into Lightburn for tracing. I will import all six into Lightburn and then select them all and make sure to align all the images to center before tracing each one. And I know this may drive some Lightburn purists crazy, but I'll move each image to its own layer and ignore the black means cut and all the other colors mean different settings mentality. When I trace, I'll check the option to delete the image afterward, and each time I do this, it adds the new vectors to an existing layer, so I'll simply select another color to place it into its own unique layer. And I know I mentioned six images, but the bottom layer, the water with the river names, actually had an outline included with the names, so once I trace that image, I'll simply separate those vectors into different layers. Now that we have each separated into individual layers, we can turn the output and show off on layers we don't want to present and use the preview function in Lightburn to check our work. The 20 by 20 inch version is now ready to laser. However, once you design the art, it should be reasonably easy to go back and add different sizes. And in this case, I'm going to go back and create a second artboard, one that is a little less than 12 by 20 inches. I'll copy my layers out from the backup and begin to customize them to work well in this new size. And much of this repeats the previous steps, simply making adjustments where elements don't fit well into that size. Now let me fast forward again and show you some of the end results of the art file as well as the Lightburn file. I mentioned this will all be on Etsy if you'd like it, so I needed to make sure my artwork and my Lightburn files were clean for others to reference as these files will be included along with normal graphics files in the Etsy downloads. I do want to say again, however, that you do not need to buy these. The goal of this video was to help you create your own. If you do want a copy of what you've just seen me work with, it will all be there. It also works to show you how I like to organize my work at the end of a project. In the Affinity file, you'll notice two artboards, the 20 by 20 inch and the 12 by 20 inch. The underlying layers of these are slightly different. Some shapes have moved a little, some of the geography has been removed for the border, and roads or area labels may have been deleted for the smaller version. 
I've also recolored the layers back to something that's easier to work with. The backup group has all the original imports, mostly unmodified. Everything you need to continue to customize these maps should be easily found in this file. In the Lightburn file, there's about 14 layers already laid out for both the 20 by 20 and the 12 by 20. You'll notice my little warning that my laser settings will not work on your laser and that you have to choose your own. But essentially, I will turn off or delete that warning layer and each layer below will have an engrave layer as well as a cut layer. This file is obviously more to get you started than a final file, but the graphics here are already imported and ready for your settings. You'll notice that both the Affinity file as well as the Lightburn, I've included a version of the raised street layer without the area labels, in case you'd like to cut a simpler version of the map. And if anyone does end up using this video to make their own version or even downloads these files and uses them, I'd love to see them. Please tag me on Instagram at This Is How I Made It. Thanks for sticking it out with me throughout this design. If you found this video helpful, please hit that like and subscribe. It really is the easiest way to help out a small YouTube channel. And if you have plans to make something like this in the future, you may want to save this video. That way it'll be in your saved videos when you finally get to this project. I'm happy to answer any questions you all have down below, and as always, thanks for watching.